Okay, good, good morning, morning, everybody. So this is the second fireside chat in the Water Sewer series, and I am delighted that we have Heather Elkington and Rachel Harris with us. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to these lovely ladies. Good morning, everybody. It is an honour to be here today with my good friend, Rachel Harris. Questions, do not hesitate from asking questions. The chat box is always open. Just make sure you have the little toggle to say, send it to everyone so we can all see it. Unless you want to send something privately, of course, you're welcome to do that. But send questions as we go through. Chuck everything in there. We want to hear it, your thoughts, key takeaways. If you disagree with us in any way, chuck it in the chat box and we're going to have a big session at the end where you'll get loads of value out of answering those questions together. Before we get started, as a way of... We, we, really, want to, we really want to give back here. And so if you share a picture of the webinar, any of the shocking stats, any of the points in the webinar of me or Rachel, please tag us in because we're going to enter you in a competition to win a 30 minute coaching session, one with each of us. So tag us in, we'll be able to see that after and we'll put you in a little sheet and draw a competition. We'd love to speak to you and have that one-on-one -on -one session. So to kick us off, I want to hear you in the chat box now. What do you think these stats are? So if we're talking about accountancy firms, five surprising principles, principles for leading accountancy firms, I want you to guess, chuck it in the chat box, what do you think these stats relate to? The 17%, the 30,000 pound, and I'll wait a couple of minutes. What do you think these stats relate to if you were to have a wild guess? Average margins, it's a good, it's a good guess. I think some of our team are here and I've shouted these statistics at them quite a few times. So I'm hoping. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, if you're in Australia, I know them off by heart. <laughs> yeah. any other guesses to what we think write offs percentage and average pay of staff, maybe again, good guess. So the first one, this is attrition staff turnover. Yes. Someone's just guessed it. So staff turnover, every time, this is how many, every single year, how many of your team leave? So it's about one in every five people leave every single year. And correct, that is the cost of rehire. So based on a 25K average salary in the UK, to rehire that person, to retrain them, recruit them, um, the loss in build hours, everything put in there, that is how much it's going to cost you to rehire. And the reason these stats are so important to stay focused on is I think we take for granted too much, our we take our team for granted too much and how brilliant they are. And if anything is going to convince you of why it is so important to invest in your team, invest in your culture, it is this. And before we get into the surprising principles, I'm just going to cross off that chat box because it's right in front of me. Before we get into these surprising principles, let's just take note of the state of play of the workplace because old school leadership principles simply do not work anymore. I did a management degree. I got a BSc, I think it was, from a top business school in business management. Everything I learned there only 10 years ago is now completely obsolete. So let's just take a look at some of the things that have wildly changed over the last 15 years. We have all been part of a huge na nation, global, global experiment that has propelled the workforce into a whole new dynamic. This time four, five years ago, there wasn't even a single day that I worked from home. I think if I would maybe be ill like once a year and I would really shyly ask if I could work from home. But it was just so normal for us all to be in the office, come in every single day. Now, if you ask an employee, even if they have been in the workforce for decades, it, is all, it, it feels like a right, it feels like an entitlement that we have time working from home. Secondly, the gig economy. Most of your employees have access to selling products on Etsy, putting the house up for rent on Airbnb, get going on Uber, going on Lyft, and making money from things just outside their full-time job. People don't rely on their full-time income from their nine to five career 
as much as they needed to this time 15 years ago. And so as employers, as managers, it is more important than ever to ensure we're creating a culture that people want to be a part of because ultimately they don't need to be. The generation, I don't even think this is defined by a generation. I think we're all, all part of this. We have been inundated with filters, social media, with fake news, and we have this crisis in authenticity in that we are demanding our employers to be authentic with us. We can see through the bullshit. We can see through the lying about numbers, lying about why. I was having a conversation with a friend yesterday over lunch, and she said to me, so she works in quite a big company in the account industry, so I won't say which one it is, and they had told the team that they need to come back in three days a week which was fine and she was okay with but the way that they had conveyed that to the team was we want you to come back in to collaborate then when they got to the office they had put this new system in whereby they can't actually speak to each other in the office and they if they want to speak to each other they have to press a button digitally to like ding i know to like ding a bell to say i want help can someone come over and speak to me and she was sat there like why have they lied to us? Like, I'm okay coming into the office three days a week. I literally live a 15 minute walk away. But tell me the truth. Like people can see through bullshit from a mile off. So we have an authenticity crisis in the workplace in which we're just all a little bit scared to be our true selves and just tell the truth. Automation and AI. Obviously you have all have heard of ChatGPT. I am starting to use it more and more in my business. But the reason this has changed the workforce so much is just that Tasks that were repetitive, that were rule-based, no longer need to be done by a human being. And so if you have those sort of tasks in your company and you have like employees who are really competent or buddy or, you know, on social media and hearing about all this new automation and AI, and you're still having them do really automated tasks, really, sorry, manual tasks, they're going to start to get tired. They're going to start to get just fed up and think, why is my company not moving forward with the times? And then lastly, a huge change in that we are all just so much more socially aware and our employees are no longer accepting companies who have a lack of values, who have a lack of purpose. Um, we, we are connecting so much more with communities across the world through globalization. We have causes that we dedicate ourselves to, that we fight for. Um, it could be to do with war, it could be to do with sustainability, anything. But people are so tuned in to this idea of companies having clear values and clear like policies around DEI and then actually putting them into place. So not to scare you with all this, we are actually going to talk today about what on earth we should do about it. And luckily for you, I am sat here today with Rachel Harris, who is a top 30 SME employer in the UK. She has an employee waiting list of, I'm going to say 200 people, but it's probably gone up since the last time we spoke, and a 100% staff retention rate from that waiting list. Rachel um, owns and runs an accountancy firm called Strivex, and we are going to run through five surprising principles to run a high-performing accountancy practice. Is there anything you want to add there, Rach? I feel like you've got a million accolades that I could talk about for them my know. favorite ones <laughs> i just want to say hi um just running through the attendee list lots and lots of familiar names and faces some inside the accounting industry some outside um this is actually a talk that heather and i first debuted at the digital accounting show and it was we were the last session of the day and it was still at, like standing room only and absolutely packed it's one of the best sessions um i've ever done in person and based on feedback from that session, because there were so many questions, we're going to ramp up the pace of delivering the content so that we can allocate as much time as possible to questions. There's a QA and a box in Zoom, as Heather said, one of the best ways to do some personal branding and marketing while you're here, as well as uh, being able to win an opportunity to spend 30 minutes with both Heather and I taking a deep dive into this stuff, is to share the fact that you're here. So do some personal branding at the same time. Um, I think the, the most important thing to kick off before we get stuck in is this stuff's really hard. 
This stuff is not covered in our accounting exams. Nobody teaches you how to be a leader while they're also teaching you tax. Uh, lots of our team are here today as well. Like this never ends. You don't just become a leader in an accounting firm and then that's your job done. This is continuous uh, work into understanding the dynamics that are changing the workforce and understanding how we can do it well, not do it perfectly but do it well. And so, yeah, really excited to get stuck in. We're going to floor it on the content. This is being recorded on demand. So don't worry about frantically writing stuff down. You can watch it on repeat and allocate time to do it properly. We're going to do a whistle stop tour of the content. And then in the meantime, put all of your questions in the Q and A for anyone that submitted questions in advance. We have compiled the top four and we're going to get stuck into those while you guys are answering, asking questions as well. We've used ChatGPT to compile the top. Yeah. Questions. Yeah, we didn't do that. Yeah. But always, like, honestly, guys, chat, if, if there's a way that you can, if there's a way that you can automate something like that, like with data, run through this data for me and compile the best, the top four questions. So firstly, your commitment to core values will make or break your culture. And this one is more it's really fresh for me at the minute because I'm doing a piece of work with an accountancy firm who have core values. They have them written down. They went through this huge exercise to make them, but nobody uses them. And having core values simply is not enough. Core values, you have to be willing to fire your top performer because they do not hold up your core values. And Rach, I know you guys have done so much work over the last, I feel like a couple of years, getting your core values to where they need to be, but also just embedding them within the team. Mm. So I'm going to hand over to you because have got some great stuff there. Of course. Um, if we've just said the words core values and your stomach's fallen out of you and you've got that sense of impending doom and imposter syndrome and you think maybe it's just you on your own and you're thinking about having a team, maybe you have a team, but you, you haven't put your core values into words, um, lean into that sentence. You haven't put them into words. So we scaled our accounting firm from our dining room table all of the way up to, we've got, we're across two offices, one Manchester, one Oxford. Uh, we've got an incredible and large team. The same core values existed on the dining room table that do now. We've just put words to them. And a really, really great exercise to do if you're just thinking about core values for the first time. If you already have a team, imagine, like think of the team member that you think, oh, if I cut you open, my company is coming out of you. Um, take that person and write down the qualities that make them that person. You probably have loads. You'll probably have adds value every time they speak to clients, always asks more questions than they answer, gives clients a great experience. Write down as many as possible. And that's a really good starting point. You'll have more than you need, but then you can start to windle it down. Maybe pick another member of staff that, that's also exceptional in different areas. What do they have in common? That's a really, really great exercise. I definitely recommend this book. This book is my Bible, which is why it sits on my desk. It's called Traction. So if you've got a summer holiday planned or you want an audio book while you're walking your dog, um, would definitely recommend you read Traction, which can also help you to do that. So don't panic if I've just said core values and you know, you've got imposter syndrome because you don't have them. You do have them. You just haven't put words to them yet. They can change. We recently tweaked one of ours because we found that one actually came up more than another. So we merged two together. And then again, committing to core cool values, we have made staff exit decisions based on core cool values um, and literally cited them in lots of the conversations that we were having in the build up to that person leaving. Um, as well as actually that being the top priority when we're recruiting as well. A change that we made that's been really impactful to make sure that the team understand you can be a high performer, but I'm also measuring you here, is core value scoring in every single appraisal. So we do six monthly appraisals and six monthly pay reviews. And in every single conversation, we literally have a scorecard from zero to five. So does them all of the time, does them some of the time and every core value with um, an internal matrix of in order to score a three, these are the behaviors that we're displaying so that people can be really tangible with that as well. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. So something that we had in our interview structure at Go Proposal. A lot of you here will know Go Proposal, but I know many of you won't. So Go Proposal was the startup company that I worked for that we sold for Sage about three years in. And core values for us 
made everything easier. It just made everything easier because it was easy. We could market our product in a way that felt true to our core values. We would attract and therefore repel the right clients because of our core values. And at one point, we went through quite a big hiring spree. Um, and we made sure to hire on the core values. So in our interviews, we would have, I think we had six core values and we would ask a situational question on each one. So it was, tell me about a time when you have done this. And by the way, we would give the questions to people beforehand. So I am not a fan of like shocking people in an interview. I don't want people, I don't, I don't want people to do well in an interview, depending on how good they are at like their brain coming up with a quick fire answer to a question. And so we always prepare people for the interviews because I'd rather hear like an authentic story. I'd rather them have time to prepare their stories. And so we had it in an interview, but then when we went through this quick, spree hiring we realized after a few months we actually had like an extra 10 human beings who hadn't really seen the core values from day one like grow and come about in our culture so we decided to do something called spotlighting what spotlighting is is if so if you have a set of core values right now say you've got it written down somewhere on a piece of paper or it might be up on your wall or it might be in your like notion or email somewhere but you don't know where to start in actually getting your team to start living and breathing these core values. You need to go through spotlighting. What that is, is every single month, and you can extend that to, to every quarter once you get good at it, every single month, spotlight one core value. So in the month, with that core value, what you're going to do is you're going to measure people on the breadth of using the core value. So breadth being how wide, how many times you've used it with a team member, how many times you've used it with a client, how many times you've used it in your personal life. And the depth being, so then we're going to measure depth, the depth being the level of understanding they have of that core value. So we had one about like um, taking accountability for things, even when they weren't your problem. And so to get deeper and understand that further, we read a book called Ego is the Enemy, which is about how we all have ego and it just we just have to become aware of it and not make decisions because of it. And so in a month, we would do the breadth and the depth and we would measure those. And then at the end of that month, we would get everyone to vote on who they thought was upholding that core value the best. And that person would win a prize and they would get like rewarded up in front of everyone. And it was a big celebration. We then moved to do that every quarter. So your commitment to core values will make or break your culture. And the thing with this is it won't happen overnight. It will be a series of small toxic behaviors that get ignored like people not upholding a core value in a meeting or not upholding a core value in a conversation and it gets ignored and then it gets ignored again and then it gets ignored again and before you know it you're a year two years maybe even 10 years down the line and you have a culture that's unrecognizable and it feels toxic it feels gossipy it doesn't it's not enjoyable to work in and then you've got a bigger problem because you've got to go back and undo it all okay Number two, and by the way, I can see questions coming through, so keep just, we're going to get to them at the end, guys, so please just as keep you think coming. of them, keep them coming. The second principle is if things aren't getting better, they're getting worse. And this is where I'm going to say a word that so many people dread, which is systemization. You may have heard that word before. We talk about systemization, automation, writing up processes. And I think it can get really complex in our head. And we think, oh my God, I've got everything's in my head and there's all these, co it feels like our business is stuck together with sticky tape. All systemization really is at its core is making sure that everything that exists in here is on your laptop or on, your, on a piece of paper, let's say, at the, at the first like stage. So for example, if I am doing a, let's say you do like a receipt filing process in your firm. What does that process look like? And it could just be five bullet points written up on a Word doc. First, the client sends the um, receipt into Dext or I don't know, other, other receipt filing softwares are available, sends it into one of those softwares. Then it, go, then it gets like filtered through, but then is there like another layer of approval? There might be like a five step, step approval process for this receipt being properly filed and properly coded. If you don't have that written down and it just exists in your brain, every single time you bring a member of staff in, you're going to have to train them deeply on it, 
they are probably going to make the same mistakes that you've made 10 times that just by writing it down, you could have helped them to never make that mistake. And ultimately, if things aren't getting better, they're getting worse. So what I mean by that is if you, when we write things down, we can only improve what we can, me- we, we can only improve what we can measure. So if you write these things down, every time we make an improvement to that process, a 1% improvement, maybe it's t- when you send the receipts through, you need to make sure that the photo has the full receipt in. Let's just say if one of your team members finds out that's one improvement for one client, if you don't have anywhere to write that down or a process to document it with, it's a complete waste. And ultimately that process, all the rest of the clients are just going to keep putting the receipts in and they're going to keep getting like pushed back on because they haven't got the full photo and it's ultimately going to be getting worse. So principle number two, guys, is about systemization and ensuring that everything you do in your firm is written down. I went through an exercise with an accountancy firm owner just yesterday where he had he uses Asana. So you can use like Asana, Notion, Monday.com, all those task organization um, things for your business. I think you guys use Notion, don't you, Rach? Yeah, we use Loop. Loop and Notion. And he literally just got a project tracker in there, 10 different columns. And in those columns, it was bookkeeping, fat returns, um, confirmation statements, like all kind of like the key pillars of what your team are going to be doing day to day. And underneath those pillars, he just had like receipt filing, bank rec, just one-on-one, all the processes, and he just got it all out of his brain. It took him less than an hour, and it was just quickly get everything out of your brain. The reason we did that is because he's got a new member of the team starting on Monday, and he's about to train her up in all the things that are in his head. Now, he can't sit there and go through it all with her, but what he can do is hand over that document and go, this is my entire brain. Let's work through each of these, so I'll train you on a new one every single week. And by the end of the three month training period, you will be, you know, fully trained up on them. When you run them with clients, you can then add in your improvements. We can keep getting better. Over to you, Rach. Amazing. Cool. Um, I'll be very brief, but I'm very excited because I have a lot to say. Um, we are like huge advocates of this. I feel like, um, one of our core values is leave it better than you found it. And we, I refer to like systems, processes and software with this all of the time. Obviously it relates to colleagues, clients, all of the, like the fluffy stuff that you would expect that core core value to relate to, but as well as all of those things, we're talking about systems and processes. So from day one, the reason we were able to scale so rapidly was upholding high service levels was because we created a second brain. The inside of Strivex is an engine. It's basically a Strivex franchise that a toddler, we could do bring your kids to work day. And someone could literally go into that and do a pretty good job of following those processes. And yeah. that leave it better than you found it, that make everything better, that systemization, Again, you referenced it, Hev, but we have over 800 clients and we are constantly trying to do customer excellence, feedback surveys, uh, like random calls to just be like, what can we do better? What part of this was under- was like frustrating for you or which bit of it did you feel confused? And so because we have like centralized standard operating procedures, process notes, and email templates, a client can say, oh, you asked me to review that set of accounts, but I actually wasn't sure what you were actually asking of me. Um, And so that is just a super quick tweak. That's a super quick change the tone of voice in that email. It could be that we then have two email templates, one for where we've got a draft set of accounts with under three queries. That's fine on an email. But if we've got a draft set of accounts with more than three, that needs to be a phone call or a different email. And so when you start to centralize things and you start to have that second brain, it not only gives you a really easy, quick tick tweak to change processes and change client experience, but it also gives you something really tangible to actually acknowledge feedback from your customers. So we treat anything as a complaint from a grumble up to, we have four levels, a grumble up to a full-blown complaint. Most of the feedback that we that we get that's negative sits in the grumble zone, not the complaint zone. And that's because the team have to self-disclose grumbles so that they don't become complaints. But even if it's a grumble, even if it was, that was a bit confusing and I didn't like that. Um, actually, it gives you something really tangible to go back to that customer and say, this is what I've done because you were really proactive in giving me that feedback. I've made a tweak to this. And so every single person who comes after you is going to get a different experience. Um, When we talk about 
if things aren't getting better, they're getting worse. Uh, we're all accountants and we've all really thoroughly enjo- enjoyed watching Heather try to explain how to import a receipt into accounting software. Um, <laughs> we are, it's almost like inflation within your business. Like if you've got a certain amount in your bank account, like inflation is decreasing the value of that constantly. And so you have to always, always be working to make sure that things are con- continuously improving whilst also empower- empowering your team to do the same. Um, I've had a couple of, uh, one 12 month and one 18 month appraisal with my team this week and the biggest bit of feedback that i repeated to both of them was be more annoying like make me say no to you bring so many ideas to me i actually have to say no to you because i don't think i've ever said no in 12 months like be more annoying love it and i've written i've written down leave it better than you found it i'm obsessed with that what a great value this is yours rach this is mine. It's, it's a beautiful one. Take take the floor. So a couple of things to say here. So this is for us one of our key principles when it comes to leading and scaling a team. Um, we make the most profit, not wealth. We make the most profit when our team are happy. And we make the most wealth when our clients are happy too. And so bringing both of those things together, we have ENPS scoring, which is employee net promoter scoring. So the team get pulse surveys every seven days and they get asked questions, weird, wacky, wonderful. Sometimes you think, what is this question even asking? The team get pulse surveyed every seven days for employee net promoter scoring. I can see a breakdown by teams, by who their manager is on relationship with manager, how strong a sense of ambassadorship they feel, how they feel about how frequent and what the quality of the communication with their manager is. And in the months where EMPS is high, profit is also high. There is a direct correlation between EMPS and profit. So I know that I can make profit when the team are happy, but I make wealth as in big value to my business if I ever wanted to sell or exit, which spoiler alert, I don't. That wealth comes from when the clients are happy. And as a firm, we kicked off this session with attrition and the average cost to replace somebody. It, in the accounting industry, it costs one between 1.3 and 1.5 of somebody's salary to replace them. And so for us, we were like, okay, if it costs between 1.3 and 1.5 of someone's salary to replace them, as well as recruitment fees, what if we just took what normal firms spend on recruitment fees and put that into creating a best-in-class, world-class benefits package. So things like employee assistance programs, private medical, private dental, gym memberships, an all-inclusive, all-expenses-paid trip abroad every year. Lots of people would look at that and think it's for social media, it's to create content. It's not. It is to retain the best talent in the industry. It's to acknowledge the fact that most firms spend that money replacing the team that aren't happy rather than just taking that expenditure from the end of the year, putting it in the beginning of the year and actually just retaining the talent. And so for us, even, you know, the dining room table vibes, we're not paying the apprenticeship minimum wage. We are paying above market rate for roles. We're putting all of that money that most firms spend in in recruitment or replacing people into creating a fantastic workforce that has flexible working, flexible policies, being able to work with advisors who make this an incredible place to work, whilst also incorporating core values into our client onboarding process. Our number one core value is don't be a dick. Our clients have to sign that when they become clients too. And so it creating a workforce that that team want to work in is prioritizing the long-term wealth and sustainability of a business. So we score 10 in job security on our EMPS software. And we're a small and rapidly scaling firm. Like in most firms our size, people wouldn't score highly in job security, but they do with us because they know too that we're prioritizing long-term wealth over short-term profit. Beautiful. Open the box. Now, what I was saying earlier about my friend who was essentially lied to by her workplace when they asked her to come in for three days a week to collaborate and then she got there and everything she experienced was the opposite of collaboration. Something really simple we did to uh, like counteract the authenticity crisis at GoProposal was 
open the box for everyone in the company. So we were almost expecting people to act like entrepreneurs, bring ideas, get excited about new processes, get excited about selling, bringing in new clients. But we weren't treating them like entrepreneurs. We weren't showing them the back end of what's happening in the business. And especially accountants who so deeply understand the P&L, just show them the top lines of the P&L. So we used to send around every single month, we would have what we called a stakeholder report. And in that report, it would be how many free trials we brought in, how many people have churned, how many people have bought into the product and the headlines. And then underneath that, it would be revenue. I can see everyone now laughing at me trying to undo a P&L just like my receipt filing process. But it would obviously just be what we've spent on marketing, what we've spent on overheads, what we've spent on all the rest of the lines in the P&L. It's something that our teams so very rarely see. Um, and we don't have to necessarily tell everyone everyone's salaries, but we can show them the line where we say, this is how much we spend on people every month. And so, of course, we want to make sure you paid your worth. But we also like just appreciate that it doesn't come from thin air and that we have to consider the business. And just by doing that, people, and when they want to spend something on marketing, they want to spend something on the office, they can then go into the P&L that they got last month and think, is this a good thing for our, to, us to spend our money on so we can make more profit, so we can get a higher pay? Um, when we opened the books in Go Proposal, it just made a huge change in how much the team trusted us, how much they could think and act like entrepreneurs, the autonomy they had over their own decision making because they, had, they could make a decision fully informed. And it wasn't just a decision based on like, the vision that I'd been feeding them or the excitement that James had been feeding them. It was based on the actual data, the actual facts and figures. And I think a lot of us are scared of opening the books because it feels like one of the most personal parts of our business. It feels like one of the scariest parts, one of the most personal parts. But even if you're not doing as well as you want to be, the team, your team, especially just a few close people in your team are the people who are going to help you get where you need to be. So start being more transparent and open up the books. You can do it with the finances, but there's so many other things you can do it with, like the goals of the business, the worries, the, the fears about the business. Um, so open the books and be more transparent with your team. Yes, yeah, so we do it um, slightly differently to how things were done at Go Proposal in terms of like showing everybody everything. So um, we are very, very transparent on like targeting and financial KPIs across the team. So every single team member, regardless of how junior or how senior, has explicit clarity on how they are measured. Every single team member um, has a desktop background with all of our core values, our core focus, our 10-year goal, our service package, things to do at every single touch point with clients. But they also have KPIs and explicit clarity in how they are measured. We have a very, very flexible working environment we have work from anywhere we have hybrid we have work from home and um the team have that autonomy because they have explicit clarity on what their targets are so we're results-based working with core values added on top and so they've all got explicit clarity on that as well and then again as a management team the open the books again for us comes around building really really a strong sense of like business simulation so that they feel like they've got clarity on where the business is going what our challenges are. So like even being very transparent. So all of our managers have access to our ENPS software as well. So they get to see how their teams are benchmarking against other teams as well. And one of the things that we haven't mentioned yet is that Heather is a client of Strivex. And I know Heather, I think Emma's, Emma is on the call. So Emma, who is Heather's accountant, um, Heather had a really positive experience with Emma because of the sense of entrepreneurial spirit that we embed into our team. Yeah, a hundred percent. So just think guys, like what can you open the books with? You your team are on social media. They are they understand they they're just not stupid. None of us are stupid. And I think we try to ha there's parts of us that are scared of of giving freedom, of showing of being transparent. But they know anyway and we, ha we are just living in a huge authenticity crisis. And the more and you I also I also feel like the authenticity comes into authenticity can help you counteract the fear that you have around opening the book. So if you said to me, would you show your team your personal tax return for last year as a practice owner, especially as of a large 
a large practice, like we're worth 1.5 million pounds now. If you said to me, would you show your team your personal tax return? The thing that's going to make me want to say no is I make a lot of money. But by being a very authentic leader, and I'm not talking about complaining all of the time, but by being an authentic leader, if I showed that tax return to members of my team, they'd probably be like, yeah, that is appropriate compensation for how hard you work, how much effort you put in, what your life is like. And so we don't all have to be stoic as leaders and not say that it's hard. And and so I feel like authenticity can help counteract a lot of the fears that lots of people do have around showing how much money they make and showing if you're also showing that this is really hard and we don't get taught how to do this and lots of us find this element of running a business as accountants very difficult they can balance each other out to create a really safe environment for your team to want to be entrepreneurial because they have no desire to be entrepreneurial because you are really authentic about what you make but the cost of that too yeah love it and I, th- I think with accountants, you guys are held back a little bit more because the conversation, I remember Ariona saying to me on, um, she's an- another firm owner, she came onto the firm up podcast and she said she pulled up to a client's, mm. she pulled up to a client's business once and they looked out the window and said, that better not be the accountant's car. And it's like this fear that, we our client do we want our clients to see us doing well you know because what if they think oh they should they're charging me too much they're making too much money um but who wants an accountant who doesn't know how to handle their money who who wants an accountant that isn't profitable that doesn't know how to make lots of money no one so yeah i feel like you guys have it even harder with stuff like that because of pre-existing just fears and stereotypes marketing isn't just to bring in customers so this is your fifth and final principle and most of you will know Rachel not even just from running this incredible accountancy firm but because of the platform that she's built on social media and demystifying accountancy making it feel a lot more fun and freeing than the industry's been used to before and so Rach what why do you do that why is that so important so the fifth principle is around not bringing in customers. Um, I actually had a second interview with somebody yesterday who I recruited because they heard me speak at Accountex. Um, one of the marketing does incredible things for all businesses. No one's ever argued that, but I think a lot of people misunderstand that marketing is only for one purpose. Employer branding has done incredible things for our practice. Like our practice is, my my long-term mission is to be the practice of choice for incredible talent in our industry. And we are doing leaps and strides to getting there. Um, for us, we make sure that at least 20% of our content is literally marketing to employees, potential employees. There is a recruitment crisis in the accounting industry at the moment, and we're on a waiting list. I, two weeks ago, replaced somebody in three days with such a short turnaround that there's like a week-long overlap between one person leaving and their replacement starting with a full handover for every single client. And again, this is part of the, we're choosing long-term wealth over short-term profit. We invest all of that branding, all of that marketing, and all of that sort of elevating me to the to be a position of authority within our industry because we're able to use that to increase our employer brand. Um, again, lots of you might have consumed that content online, but for us, our marketing serves more than one purpose. When, when we just started, I was in one place on one platform with one purpose, and that was to find clients to pay my mortgage. But as we've grown and like my position in the industry has developed actually employer branding is a huge part of that in terms of telling great stories so the session that i did at accountex that ended up we ended up hiring or are going to hire uh, an assistant manager from was actually about employer branding and so we had someone talk about why they left big four because they wanted more when previously there's been a huge stigma around leaving big four to come to small practices why she did that One person literally in 2023 put on their vision board, 
I'm going to work for Strivex Accountants and like manifested to work for us. That is the following and the brand that our practice is now attracting, that people are manifesting to work there. And that's not an accident. That's not accidental. That is incredible marketing turned into incredible branding, turned into employer brand, turning into a tap of talent that I can turn on and off as we scale. Yeah. And don't you think as well, so here we've said it isn't just to bring in customers, but also to make get it gets customers to feel more loyal towards the brand, like they feel part of something. I know as a customer of Strivex, it feels like I'm a customer of Strivex, mm. like Strivex are my accountants. Do you know what I mean? You would never, I don't know how many other business owners have huge pride in saying this is look at my accountant <laughs> do you know what i mean like yeah. here she is like but here they are here the company is um and if anyone comes to me and said i'm looking for an account i'm looking for an accountant it's not just oh let me put you in touch with mine it's i'll quickly share their instagram profile and you're sold and so it's not just to bring in customers but for the fact that me as a customer of Strivex just feel so loyal and so proud and so like excited to talk to people about who my accountant is and the retention yeah. that that must you know which is wild right i feel like as accountants like the words that have just come out of your mouth are words so that we recorded someone, that <laughs> yeah like if someone could write what i want my clients to say in rooms that i'm not in copy and paste that and yeah. that's what branding can do that's what like we are digital we are remote i can service clients anywhere in the uk but they also see me every single day on socials sharing authentic journey understanding that i'm going through the same stuff that you are and being able to to do that as well and i feel like there's a really strong where all of this or where all of the principles we've spoken about today come into play is actually in business. I did an MBA after I became an accountant. So I love a, I love a two by two, four square graph. And actually the really, really sweet spot is where you have high customer engagement and high team engagement because your customers will not love your business until your team do as well. And so the reason Heather is saying those words about Strivex is because she wasn't sold the dream by me and then put onto a conveyor belt is because every single person that she speaks to from Strivex embodies all of the same values, has good work-life balance, like embodies everything that I am. That's your experience at every touch point as well. And so the point that we want to get to is high customer engagement, high team engagement. And that's why you are bright green on this four by four square. And then last question for you before we move into the Q&A. My question to you is, you are a good few years into your journey with marketing, whereas a lot of people listening to this may be day one, or even they've tested something out, they've put a few photos on Instagram and it's not quite gone their way. What advice would you give to the day one, Rachel? Like if someone is in the position right now where they've maybe got an Instagram account, got a LinkedIn, but just like, what's the first thing that you do? Okay. I have two things to say. The first is uh, I talk a lot about personal branding with my team to try and encourage them to create their own brands and their own marks on the industry. I'm a firm believer that, that a personal brand is an asset that you'll take with you for the rest of your life and you won't need a CV as long as you've got a personal brand. And so I talk a lot with our, our team about that. And one of my team members said to me yesterday, personal branding is cringy until you're Rachel. Like everybody wants to do personal branding when you've got 100,000 people listening to you nobody wants to create a personal brand when it's two people that you went to school with and your boyfriend who follow you. So the first is like, just acknowledge that it will feel like you're, you're speaking into the abyss for a long time. You're not, people are watching you. People are watching and personal branding with the intention of, you know, making people do a certain action, whether that's become an employee, become a team member is slow but you're planting seeds and you're planting seeds every single day that you might not see tomorrow, but you've got to, you've got to keep going. Mm -hmm. And then the second tip is fail, fail. Our, as a marketing team, I'm responsible for like all of the high level strategy. And then I have a full-time member of staff who does digital marketing. She's incredible. She's been with me for 18 months. She came straight from school and so she's literally apprentice. Like she is me in an apprentice form and she is KPI'd on how frequently we fail, which as accountants 
is horrible and you probably all went oh when i said it fail you have to fail she is literally scored on how often we can do something implement something try something and fail because if something fails three times on socials the fourth time will be and at least war will be brilliant and will do all of the things that you want it to do but yeah. social media personal branding whether it's linkedin instagram tiktok youtube i create content on all of those platforms it is not something that we can reconcile it's hard it changes it develops and so you have to make yourself do that too and so scoring yourself on how frequently you can fail is the best way to reverse engineer all of the imposter syndrome that being an accountant on social media will give you yeah we did we had that as well it's really valuable we had our, our actual kpi was how many experiments have we run this month how yeah. many failed how many succeeded and it's just a very factual failure is great it just yeah. gets us one step closer to where we need to be okay so i'm gonna move us into q a we've got 15 minutes left we've got a few questions on here so these were questions that were asked beforehand we've kind of do you know what i'm gonna shut up let's get straight into them so how to transition from being a react reaction transactional accountant to to a proactive finance leader rachel i'm gonna hand this to you because it's accountants specific um clarity i think is the first first point so for us in terms of being a leader at strivex our our chargeable team members have very explicit KPIs, which I said earlier. Our managers are not responsible for generating revenue themselves. They are responsible for the team. And so clarity from the person you report to on now that I am in a leadership position, I understand what I need to do, but how are you measuring me? So taking away billable work from our leaders is very intentional because I need them to feel like they have an opportunity to leave things better than they found it, constantly be improving processes, constantly be helping other people to be able to generate more. And so have a very, very proactive conversation with the person who is your leader on now that you are in a leadership position, what is going to change? I think acknowledging that you, nobody is teaching you how to be a leader at any point in your exams you can go all of the way up to be a chartered accountant and nobody is teaching you leadership. I had to go off and do an MBA, a master's in business to be taught some form of leadership skills. And through that and consuming Heather's content, I feel half qualified <laughs> to do it. And so seeking education in alternative formats. Um, again, once you've, normally once you've qualified to be an accountant, you don't want to engage in formal study again. And so a lot of our leaders again, incorporating things like fail time. So how can you allocate, if, if previously you were allocating 20% of your time to study, how can you allocate 20% of your time to be continuously improving as a manager? Whether it's reading stuff like this, bringing core values into the business, bringing ideas. I would formally request that a percentage of your working time is available, blocked out of your diary. You're not responsible for telling anyone what you're doing during that time, but it is constant and impressive personal development. And if you accept, even if you are just asking that question, how do I become a proactive leader? You're 50% of the way there. Yeah. Most people never stop and ask the question, how do I grow into this? How do I learn? If you are willing to put your ego to the side and accept that you need to grow, you need to educate yourself in this position, yeah. you're 50% of the way ahead than most other people who are in management positions. The next question feels like I asked it. I didn't ask it. It's <laughs> how can a business maintain great culture in a period of sustained growth? So I feel like we've been growing since day one of Strivex. And this is, this is hard. Again, our ENPS scoring is four times the industry average. So for anyone that doesn't know, net promoter scoring is how likely your customers are to refer you to a friend. Uh, it's quite brutal in the, the metrics. So your customers have to be scoring you nine or 10 to be considered a promoter. Anywhere in between six and nine is amber. And then anything past that is red and it detracts your score. So this is a score from minus 100 to 100. NPS scoring is your customers and ENPS is your team. I think from my experience and what's worked very well for us during growth is being really open about what the challenges of working for your team are. 
Like work, if you are a leader who wants to progress in your role very quickly, working for a rapidly scaling firm will be fantastic for your career. But it'll also be horrible too. And I think acknowledging that being a rapidly scaling firm will be the best and worst bit about that person's job. It'll be bad because things change all of the time. That can feel quite stressful. It can feel a little bit difficult. But as long as we're working together really well, it'll be fine. But I think a lot of people are sold dreams in interviews, on in onboarding, and the reality is very different. Whereas like I will sit in interviews and say, this is a rapidly scaling accounting firm. And you might have worked for a top firm that actually hasn't grown for 25 years. This is what a normal day is going to look like at StriveX. And this is going to give you the opportunities to create your own personal brand, have speaking opportunities, leadership opportunities. You will be rapidly scaling yourself at the same time as working here. But these are all of the bad bits. Mm -hmm. And I think having that conversation up front can save you staff turnover. Like our staff turnover is very low. And I think a lot of it is expectation setting. Yeah. And core values. Like we, when we went through rapid growth, the thing that enabled every conversation that happened behind closed doors, every meeting, every time an employee was acting in a way that wasn't right for the business or toxically, core values were the thing that would save the culture in those moments because the team would not stand for it. They wouldn't put up with gossip. They would, anything that made them uncomfortable, they would bring it to their manager as opposed to just like gossiping about it behind the scenes. And so core va- when I said earlier, core values will make everything in your life easier. Keeping a great culture in a period of sustained growth is one of those things that will make it easier. Um, and never ignoring difficult conversations, I would say. Never, ever, ever ignoring, like just if you see something that makes you feel slightly uncomfortable, calling it out in like a private room with that person. If someone is like late to meetings over and over again, or they are disengaged in meetings, just having a conversation with them, obviously always practice empathy, but like when you ignore those small things, like we said, they will just grow and grow over time. And as you're, business grows it's that thing that will grow whereas if you have core values and you never ignore the small stuff and you develop like a healthy culture unit as you grow that culture will scale with it Um, and being able to tie it all back to core values comes from if every single team member has explicit clarity on our core focus as a business and our 10-year goal mm -hmm. and they understand that those things are things that they should be able to see, hear, and feel every day at work through our core values. It means that when I have to give someone feedback, I can directly attribute it to core values because they understand this is the direction that we're going in. Very quickly, someone said that they joined halfway through. It is being recorded and it is being shared afterwards. Um, Next question is, how do you balance? I'm going to increase the pace because there's lots of questions to get through. Um, How do you balance client expectations versus work-life balance slash weekend working? This is something that me and Heather talk about all the time because we're very close friends (laughs) uh, inside and outside of work. Um, So Heather, how do you balance client expectations? Because I know that you actually communicate with some of the people that you work with on like WhatsApp and stuff too, right? So it's even harder. This is my face. Uh, I don't think I can answer. (laughs) I don't think I've found it yet. Um, Just becoming best friends with the word no, slowing down your response time. Like I feel as though we live in a world where everything is so instant and it's okay to not answer emails within 10 minutes. It's okay not to respond to WhatsApp messages immediately. Like my phone is always turned upside down and over there Mm. because if I see those things up, turn notifications off. Um, Just set again, if you can't measure it, you can't improve what you can't measure. And if we go back to value, or which one was it? Number two, if things aren't getting better, they're getting worse. Your work-life balance will be getting worse if you don't have some clear written down boundaries in place. So maybe just get a document up for yourself today. Write down what are the five that we don't speak to clients outside nine to five. How do we communicate that to them in, the, in a way that's going to be beneficial for them? You know, like you don't want them to have a bad work-life balance either. So write those things down and try and stick to them. But honestly, my face is a bit of a grimace. Because I feel like I'm on the opposite spectrum though, because I'm like very heavily introverted and so very quickly had to implement like very strict rules around client expectations and communication. So I only clear my inbox once a day. My life rule, if I could have it tattooed on my forehead, is nobody emails the fire brigade. Like if someone's emailing you, you clearing your inbox and operating on inbox zero every 24 hours is enough. 
we're accountants, we're not saving the world. So we're not like putting fires out. So nobody emails the fire brigade. I do that to protect my sanity. Like it, it requires a lot to grow a firm and me clearing my inbox is not going to change the world, but me having dedicated time to do that and dedicated time to do other things is really important. And then the second tip is to be constantly in tune with your quality of life. So we do a quality of life audit every single year and I've built on demand content to teach other people how to do the same. Very often money and maybe NPS scoring is the only way that you're measuring how successful your business is but actually how often are you looking intrinsically and comparing why you started your business to where you are now and scoring yourself based on that? Because really that's why people become Mm self-employed. How to get real drive and accountability installed into team leaders so they can make a difference in their own team. So drive and accountability. So I'm going to say drive is kind of like motivation and accountability. The way you get people motivated is to make sure that they're always progressing in something. So the progress principle, what, are those team leaders progressing in? What growth brands do you have in place for them? Like what career progression plans do you have in place for them? Is their salary growing? Is their, are their skills growing? That's how they're going to feel motivated and be driven. Accountability comes in with um, how are you holding them accountable? So do they have clear KPIs and metrics? And then when they don't hit those KPIs, do you ask questions like, what are we changing next month to make sure that this doesn't happen again. If they do hit them, it's okay. What's gone really well to make sure that we do more of it. Just constantly pushing accountability like back onto them. Um, Because accountability in other people, if you want to make someone accountable, it's done by asking closed ish ended questions that prompt them to give you an accountable answer. And you just have to keep small, like small steps in asking those questions I feel like I could talk about accountability forever, but we've got two minutes. And so it's a tricky one. Um, Um, But yeah, um, progress principle and ask the right question. Never ignore if something is missed to hold them accountable. There's been some really interesting ones come through on the chat as well. So I'll I'll try and do these as fast as possible. So the first is, do you think there is a loss of teaching personal skills and learning by remote working? Heather, I know you have a lot to say on this. Yes, is would be my short answer. Um, but I don't necessarily think that means we have to force or like mandate, and I used that word the other day, but like mandate people to come into an office to do those things. But if you are a, re- a remote first culture, I do j- truly believe that like having time together in person, it, it could be monthly, even if it's if you're globally, like could it be quarterly? Try and do it if you can. And acknowledging what is lost and trying to simulate that in different ways. Like we, we are a huge, um, we don't pay the apprenticeship minimum wage, but we have lots of people who are training and, and doing apprenticeships. And so I've done a lot of work around how can we simulate soft skills um, remotely, even if we're not doing it in person. Uh, this is a very interesting one. Next question. I have a, a good answer on this one is how do you get partners to adopt core values where they feel this is a burden and not relevant to them? My argument would be the core value should be coming from the partners based on their mission, strategy and focus for the business and should be distributed from there. But Heath, I feel like you maybe have worked with practice owners that have had this. Yeah, there's always so partners across practices are always bought into different methodologies and different ways of thinking. Um, I would just take it as like a you need to get them bought in. And quite often, if, if a partner's not bought in, just take a case to them, like, please just hear me out with this one. Explain to them, do, do a bit of research on core values. You will get a million and one stats come up that tell you the ROI of core values to do with retention, to do with marketing, everything. Take a case to them and be like, can you just see how this can make your team the running of your team the ROI of every client that you bring in bigger and just just sell it to them um I've had to Um, do that multiple times final question because this is the juiciest question I think I've ever seen on a webinar which Which is actually was sent anonymously is it better to invest more time and resources into natural high performers in the team or to invest in training average or underperformers? Whoever sent this question, round, round of applause. Interesting. I would say, I would always say improve your strengths. Don't focus on your weaknesses. 
Um, but I wouldn't say to not invest in the underperformers. I would say if you've already identified that they are an underperformer and you have gone through difficult conversations, performance management, you've tried to train them, why are they still there? Um, obviously give them a fair chance and make sure you support them properly. But if that's regular to where you get to the point where you're like, I can't even focus on this person anymore, they shouldn't really still be there. Yeah. Um, but I would say, I would probably say everyone deserves a fair chance at being invested in. Um, but when it comes to underperformers in particular, I would just question why they're there. Yeah, someone just said in the chat, you are held back by your weakest link. Yeah, we have a really easy um, question that we ask when we're, when we're you know, discussing whether or not somebody, somebody should be performance managed or whether there's a core value check. And that is, if every single person in the business was like this one person, would your business get better or worse? And it's very normal to have people where the business would stay the same or the business would get better. And it's the people where if every single member of your team was that one person, if the business would get worse, those are the people that need performance management with the context of, you know, great performance management doesn't result in someone losing their job. It is resulted in them enjoying their work better and feeling more joy at work. Uh, don't forget that uh, if you've enjoyed the session today and you would like 30 minutes of time with me and Heath, uh, I've put my Instagram link in the chat. Um, we would absolutely love to hear from you. So if you share the fact that you were here today on social media uh, across any platform, then you'll be entered to win some time with me and Heath. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you so much, Heather and Rachel. I've written down a ton of notes. So <laughs> <laughs> I've got lots to work on, but it's it's nice to see where we are doing stuff within my business and where there's some new ideas from this webinar that I want to take forward with my manager and develop my leadership skills. So thank you so much. I hope that everybody on this webinar has got some you know, great insights and value from this content. Get involved with that competition. You want those 30 minutes with these guys. Um, but yeah, all to say is uh, stay hydrated <laughs> with this heat. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you again, Rachel and Heather. And look forward to seeing you on the next one. Amazing. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.